Pro wrestling is an ever-evolving industry, with encyclopedias being updated, documentaries being released, and relationships mended or destroyed. The attitudes and narratives of wrestling superstars begin to change. Individuals like the Ultimate Warrior, Bruno San Martino, and others are brought back into prominence while the history of some of the other bright characters are being washed away or changed. Some are pigeonholed and being remembered for that one event or that one specific moment in time. Others become as insignificant as a crossword answer. My job as PWP's resident historian is to remind you of the impact that these individuals and teams left on the industry. This is PW Profiles. Which professional wrestler won two NCAA titles, was an alternate at the 1948 Olympic Games, founded a wrestling promotion, okay. has the longest combined reign as a world champion in North America, has the third single longest world title reign, and is only one of seven men inducted into the WWE WCW and Professional Wrestling Hall of Fame. Would you be able to tell me who that is? Well, uh, Hulk Hogan never started a wrestling promotion. He just uh, carried him on his back, brother. Uh, but I'm also <laughs> looking at a picture of him, but I will pretend I don't know who this guy is. So I don't I don't know who you're talking about, Logan. Who are you talking about? Who is this man's man you're telling me about? I'm talking about Vern Gagne. Vern Gagne. I, is that the same guy that body slammed that other old man? In the... That is. Wow. That is. Man, it's like we just talked about him like last um, episode. What a, what a what a great guy. I mean, he he is a great. guy. You know, that, that he was, was, was a great guy. That wasn't him. Like I like I mentioned, two NCAA titles. There's an alternate for the U.S. wrestling team. In 1948, he also was drafted by Papa Bear Hallis of Chicago Bears fame. Um, he was a man's man. He served as in the U.S. Marine Corps during World War II. Just anything that you could think of, it seems Vern Gagne had done. Now, it seemed football was going to be his pastime, but at this time... Professional wrestling was a better financial endeavor than football. Um, he was told about this by both wrestling and NFL great Bronco Nagurski, as he moonlighted as a professional wrestler. And from there, Vern was off. He debuted in 1949. He ended uh, his first match, actually, had former heavyweight champion Jack Dempsey as a referee. He became the NWA's version of a junior or light heavyweight championship. Um, and then he was just one of the bigger guys in the 40s and 50s. As the 50s came to an end, he tried challenging for the NWA title. But as all things go, there's backstage politics. You know, this territory wants its main guy to be the champion. Minneapolis wasn't really viewed as a big um, territory. One brought in a lot of money. It wasn't a St. Louis. It wasn't a California. So Vern formed his own promotion, the American Wrestling Alliance. Um, the AWA, on a brief side note, was kind of the ECW or the TNA of its time. It always had top guys. It had your Hogan's, your Road Warriors, your Ric Flair's. But they always got poached away. But like ECW and TNA, they would find a new talent. Uh, the story goes, before Hulk Hogan challenged for a heavyweight championship around Christmas, 
Vern Gagne was sent a telegram that said Hogan wouldn't be appearing. It was from Florida, so he thought it was Eddie Graham, the promoter in Florida, trying to play a rib on him. He ripped it up. Hogan no-showed the event. He tried calling him, and Hogan said Vince was paying him more to not appear, although Vince denies this in the AWA documentary. Um, this also happened with other stars, where you know Mean Gene also chose to go to WWE before, um, without fulfilling his duties in the AWA. But like I said, you know, you lose Hogan and Mean Gene. A few years later, you get the Road Warriors. You lose the Road Warriors. A few years later, you get Mr. Perfect and Rick Martel. So AWA always had um, talent. This is because Vern had an eye for talent. Besides his wrestling, he was a big-time trainer. He trained Iron Sheik, Sergeant Slaughter, Scott Norton, Blackjack Lanza, and Blackjack Mulligan. Mad Dog with Sean, Mr. Perfect, Bob Backlund, Ric Flair, and Ricky Steamboat. So a who's who of heavyweight and tag team champions of the era. Now, when he started the AWA, as I said, it was more about the heavyweight title. Um, his AWA put the NWA on kayfabe notice. They told the NWA that if Pat O'Connor didn't defend his title against Vern Gagne within 90 days, Vern Gagne would be recognized as the first AWA champion by default. Now, I give them credit for this, as most promotions at the time would just kind of hand the belt to someone or, you know, say they won it in a tournament in Brazil. Right. But Vern here, you know, he stood up and he said, that's my title, damn it. I want it. Obviously, Pat O'Connor didn't show up, so Vern was recognized as the first champion. A tremendous feuds with people like Gene Kanitsky, Fritz Von Erich, Ray Stevens, Mad Dog Vashon, and my personal favorite, who we'll get to in a later episode, Nick Bockwinkle. Um, Bern Gagne held 10 AWA championships between 1960 and 1981 even going out on top for his initial retirement as AWA champion. He'd continue wrestling for the AWA, kind of doing a Bruno San Martino thing where he would come in and wrestle with his son or allies of his son until the AWA eventually closed. Now, a little bit before it closed, Vern showed he was still ahead of the times, he had his finger on the pulse as the AWA started appearing on ESPN. This was 1985. So you figure the WrestleMania boom it was just happening. Right. And Vern Gagne is getting a TV deal with ESPN. Could you imagine if he would have been able to keep the talent where the AWA would be at today? And that's when uh, ESPN was really starting to take off too. Yeah. Right, right yeah, before. and the big reason that it said that they could no longer keep the ESPN deal is because WWE kept poaching the talent. And the issue with this was the, the talent that would leave to WWE and NWA was the Hulk Hogan, the Road Warriors, you know, the charismatic enigmas. So this caused Vern Gagne to only want technically sound champions, technically sound people. Thus, you know, your Rick Martels or your Brad Rayans, Larry Zabiscos, which nothing against these wrestlers, but they obviously weren't Hulk Hogan. They weren't Ric Flair. Now then, once the AWA eventually did close its doors... Um, Vern Gagne really didn't do too much in wrestling until 2006 when he was inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame by his son, Greg Gagne. Um, this was a crowning achievement because Vern was one of the first individuals to be inducted who wasn't seen as a WWE guy. Before this, um, most of the WWE Hall of Fame inductees were influential within WWE. That's why you have your Arnold Scollins and your James Dudleys being inducted. People that eyebrows were raised when they were put in, 
but when you learn more about them, you realize they played a heavy hand in WWE's infancy, especially for Vince Jr. Um, seeing Vern Gagne finally get recognized by the WWE was a big moment. He, as I said, there's an AWA documentary. It seems WWE got the AWA rights so they could show a lot of the clips, a lot of the tapes, which this is where a lot of traditional wrestling was held. Now, I am just, I'm a big AWA guy. It's classic wrestling, submissions, technicality, and Vern Gagne was one of the influential parts in this promotion, obviously. He was the master of the headlock. He was the master of the head scissors. A 10-time world champion who now you don't see a lot of. He doesn't really appear in Legends of Wrestling games. Didn't really have a lot of figures released. You don't see a lot of Vern Gagne merchandise. And by the time wrestling conventions started taking off, a lot of the AWA faithful no longer were around. So all of this and all of his accolades are why I am pleased to introduce Vern Gagne as the very first of a long list of PW profiles. <laughs>